Welcome to He Said, She Said Razor Branding Podcast with Michael Russo and Jackie Russo. To learn more about how to improve your brand, visit brandrusso.com. Hi, welcome to another episode of He Said, She Said Razor Branding Podcast. Michael and I are so excited to have spent some time with Jeff Barsh. He is a storyteller. He's a raconteur. Um, He had some similar uh, background in L.A. like I did. And Michael, I think you may have carried uh, the weight on this one. I felt like you asked more questions than I did this time. I know. And I thought you would because of the Hollywood connection. But um, but no, he was I mean, we kind of do some similar things. And I'm I'm a big proponent and um fan of the storytelling thing, you know, it kind of is my, my, uh, kind of my thing too. It's your jam. Um, It's my jam in my own way, but, um, yeah. And it's, it's, you know, like I said, you talked about the challenges and the rewards and how we face that battle every day with, uh, clients either buying into it or understanding it or understanding the need for it and really sticking with it over time. It's, um, but it's so important to to brand building and forming emotional connections, all the things that we kind of preach about all the time. Yeah. Well, I think that um, our listeners are going to really enjoy this. And so without further ado, let's oh, wait, get wait, into wait. it. No, wait, wait. I have to say, because there is a word you use in there. I almost wanted to point it out in the middle. Tangential? Tan- Tangentially. Tangentially. Is that what you said? Tangentially. Okay. I have no That's idea what that word. means. It sounds it means cool. Like, um, it means uh, next to. It's it's next to. It's, it's uh, yeah, no, kind no, of- no. Connected, but next to it. It's not in it. It's next to it. Well, I, I got it in context because I was like, okay, okay. Well, that's, that's what that that's what must be what that meant. That or she that just means. made up a word entirely, but no. you didn't flinch. So I figured it was right. So <laughs> it is the word of today. If you're listening to the podcast, listen for the word tangent. Say it again. Tangentially. Tangentially. All right. That was it. What am I? You can proceed now. I'm so dead. Uh, okay, so if this hasn't been enough for you, please continue and listen to our chat with Jeff. And joining us today is Jeff Barch, who is a visionary storyteller, communication strategist, and founder at Story Greenlight. With over 20 years of experience in the entertainment industry and online business, Jeff has helped helped shape content for clients, including ABC, NBC, Universal, Disney, Apple, and many others. Jeff's commentary has been featured in major publications, including Time Magazine. USA Today, and the Associated Press. Through Story Greenlight, Jeff and his team empower experts and professional advisors to tell their stories, serve more clients, and expand their impact in the world. He believes that the power of story is within reach of everyone and that human connection is everything. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. It is so cool to be here with you guys. I'm looking forward to our time here. So am I. Uh, As soon as you got booked, I was very geeked out because you, I think, uh, approach storytelling in a similar way that we do here at the agency. And Mm -hmm. I think that people vastly underestimate the power of stories. I I talk all the time about um, these B2B clients that we work with. And when we first um, get them, like, you know, little strays on the side of the road, uh, and they're standing there with their laundry list of features, and they want... um, to tell me that the reason people come to them is because the company is 20 years old and has 300 employees and did um, $150 million in business last year. And I'm like, nope, that's none of the reasons why the company's coming to you. So how do you <laughs> approach messaging? What's your um, your kind of process? That is a loaded question. That is a we'll loaded question. Start easy. I, we'll start easy, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> so, well, first of all, could I ask uh, what? So, could I ask for some clarification? Because I mean, there, there are a gazillion ways I could go for go, go Absolutely. with that. Absolutely. So yeah. I I think about you know I'm not a writer. I, I am a speaker. I'm an orator, but writing is not my strength. And mm-hmm. so I always think you know what. There's got to be a process. There's got to be steps you can follow. It's got to be a recipe. And that mm-hmm. is going to help. And I know that's not a particularly creative way to approach it, but it helps, I, in my opinion, for me to bring the little bit of creativity in that area that I have out. And so, you know, I start by researching the company, looking at the current messaging, contemplating um, who the target audience is, what the unique point of differentiation is. All of those things start to kind of coalesce around an idea for me and then I can sort of go. So, I mean, do you sit and stare at the ocean? You know, what's, what's your start? How do you gear yourself up? Yeah. I say the, the beginning point is always in my world, it's always the definition of what a story is, because when you get this definition, right, 
it literally provides the foundation for any interaction between any human being for any reason ever, period. So if you want to start out with making a bold promise, that's it. And I promise I'm not exaggerating because here's, here's the thing. If you, um, a lot of people in the business world are familiar with Donald Miller and building a story brand. Some of this is built on some of his earlier fictional writings that I've expanded upon. And I always say that the definition of a story is where a character wants something, overcomes obstacles to get it, and experiences transformation as a result. So when you take, when you start with that definition in any communication between any human being, personal, business, marketing, sales, one-on-one, -on -one, internal, external, you name it. That definition will inform how you move forward because it applies to everyone. It applies to me in my own personal story. It applies to anyone that I'm talking to. It applies to the business itself as an entity. You know, the business wants to survive. What does the business need to survive? Well, the business needs to conduct transactions at a profit in order to be sustainable, you know, and you have all these other folks and all these other people who, and stakeholders who are part of this, they all have their own storylines that that definition informs. And so the more people you add, the more messy things get and the more complicated things get. But really, when you think about it, the starting point is always that definition. It's, it breaks down this complex web of human communication into the core elements that literally operate like gravity. We're talking about identity, who people are, who they want to be, who they have been, who they aspire to be. You have what they want. And anytime you want something, there will always be something getting in the way of you getting it. And so that's where we as business people say, hey, we have a product or service to come in and help you get what you want. And then of course, what is the change that you want to see happen at the end? So that's, that's the beginning of how you start to craft together those things. And when you truly understand what people want, when you truly understand what they want and why they want it, that's what enables you to take a regular message and you elevate it from something ordinary to something extraordinary. And that is when the magic happens. Yeah, I think we, we, you know, we have a very similar approach and using different terminologies maybe and different ways to get there, but you know, we're really audience focus. Like we got, you have to know your audience. You have to know who you're talking to, right? And you're mm -hmm. able to kind of tell them the story that will resonate with them and then position yourself in a way that how do you, how does your audience see how what you do can enhance their lives? How do they see mm -hmm. the benefit? How do they see, oh, this, this thing can help me. This thing will make my life easier. This thing will make me more money. This thing will make, do something, right? And so that, that has a big part of it as well. You know, where do you see that element at? Um, you talked about, um, the uh, story brand thing with Don Miller. Jackie's a, a big advocate of that. She's read his books and she's constantly pushing back to me and my team all the time and saying, you know, well, let's follow this this metrics and this sign. I, I kind of run some problems with that sometimes because I think what I'm getting to is for the average person that, that's trying to put all this together, mm -hmm. you can see that template and it it's hard. You know, I can fill yes. out all of the, I can fill out all the questions and I can do all the things. What's my villain? What's my this? What's my that? And you do all that and you're left with all these things and you're like, okay, now what? And it's it's yeah. so hard to jump that thing. And it, it seems easy until you go to do it. And then it's like, all right, where's all the pieces now? How do I actually go about that? Because storytelling and telling a story, it's kind of the new new buzzword out there right now. You hear a lot of people talking about it, but mm -hmm. doing it is is a different, different level. Well, and I will I will say, you know. Most people look me up and they say, oh, well, Jeff, you're the guy who spent 20 years out in Hollywood and that's where you learned about storytelling. And the fact of the matter is that a, 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 the bulk of the professional development of what I've been of what I've been thinking about and implementing and now uh, coaching with my clients is based out of my time in L.A., in Hollywood. But the thing is, I, I realized that there are commonalities that bring all of this together. And uh, it's something that I've been doing for my whole life. And I can tell you about a very formative moment where that started and where it set all, that all up. But before I get there, the, back to your point of this stuff feels hard. That's one of the primary challenges about storytelling, because if you go to a Hollywood screenwriter, they're going to tell you 
well, you need 97 plot points in order for this screenplay to work. And you need to hit this element at this number of pages into your script. Otherwise, you're hosed or, or just whatever. And all of a sudden, you're drowning in plot points and moving elements. And it's, it is hard. It's complicated. And so when you get into the business world and, and people know that the story stuff is powerful, but then they say, well, I tell stories to people all the time. And, you know, I hear a lot of people doing it really badly. And so I think that's this story stuff is just for the professionals. And it's for, it's for the people standing up on the TED Talk stage. And it's, it's I, I have numbers to hit. Don't tell me about the squishy story stuff. I, we need to hit our quotas. We need to hit the numbers. And I'm here to tell you, number one, story is every bit as powerful as we have always felt and always thought. And it is absolutely that powerful when it's applied in the right way to the business context. Number two, story is absolutely attainable for anyone. I promise you, story does not have to have 87 plot points. You can build a, you can build a, life altering story around one word the word is change if you tell if you tell a story around change and you tell it in the right way to the right people you will change their life and that is the whole point and that is why story is so powerful and so it's it's all about figuring out okay how can we take all these crazy frameworks that feel and actually are pretty complicated can be how can we make that how can we boil it down in a way that it's approachable so you can unlock that power for everyone? And that's what I do with my clients in the accounting world. And that's what I do with uh, in conversations like this. I love the way that you approach story. And I think that uh, for a lot of B2B companies, they think that's something fine for, you know, a luxury uh, company or a shoe company or a restaurant, but that doesn't apply in the B2B space. So how do you start to make that translation for story in such an industrial or professional services or manufacturing arena? Yeah. Well, and so that that's the, I mean, and, and one can even say it's like not even in just the B2B world, but in the B2C world, hey, we sell white t-shirts. How are we supposed to tell a story selling white t-shirts? I mean, you can do it, but the thing is you have to, uh, you have to look at the bigger picture of things because a lot of people, and, and I confess, I mean, I used to think that storytelling you know, the tactical telling of a story was the cure for all the world's ills. You know, I was a hammer and I thought the whole world was a nail. <laughs> Hollywood likes to say, Hollywood likes to think that everyone wants to be like us. Everyone wants to do things like us. And that the fact is that's just not true. But um, the thing is, when we think about the concept of story, we are, we are so familiar with it because we're living our own storyline every day. We tell stories in one form or another to people all the time. And so familiarity can breed contempt or say, oh, well, that's not the important stuff, especially when it says, oh, well, I feel something, but feelings are all kind of squishy and I'm in business. And how do you quantify the squish factor? Uh, never mind. So the power of this comes when you zoom out to the 30,000 foot view and you say, okay, what is not just the tactical version of storytelling? What is the strategic element of storytelling. And that's where I, that's where I like to take people and elevate the concept to strategic storytelling. Going back to that definition of what we talked about, the character who wants something overcomes obstacles to get it and experiences transformation as a result. I promise you, you can apply those elements of identity, obstacles, desire, and change to any business, any product, any service, anywhere, period, full stop, I promise you, it applies to you. It applies to your business. And when you can give a, and especially within a marketing context, when you can say, this is the, this is the result that you will get. And people say, okay, well, don't sell the features, sell the benefits. So you can tell people about the benefits, but I always tell people that, uh, you want to tell people about the benefits, but the power of the benefits does not come from the benefits themselves. You know, everyone talks about uh, about Apple and their genius marketing campaigns, 
Everyone talks about Steve Jobs walking up on the stage and holding up the, uh, oh, oh, good grief. I almost said, I yes, iPod. <laughs> uh, the, the box with all the music on it. Yeah. But you so got I, iPad, you got iPod, you got iWatch. I mean, it's a lot of eyes. So I, yeah. you're forgiven. Yeah. So you get the, Steve Jobs walking out on stage with an iPod and everyone in the world at that time is saying, we have a box that can put this many megabytes of files on it. And Steve Jobs comes out and says, this is a thousand songs in your pocket. And everyone says, holy moly, that's an amazing benefit. I want that. But what I want to do is help people help people realize it doesn't come from the thousand songs in the pocket. That's not where the power comes from. The power comes from the fact that, uh, well, the hint for where that power comes from comes from the TV ads where you saw all those black silhouetted people dancing with ear pods in their head, well, with uh, with air with with headphones in their ears at that point, and they are enjoying the freedom. I was about to say having, That's yeah, it's free. It, it's the freedom. They're dancing and they are loving life. They're loving the freedom of having the soundtrack of their life in their ears anywhere they go. Now, if you go out and you say. And you're Steve Jobs and you walk on, you say, this box will give you personal freedom. Everyone's going to go, wah, wah. You know, that's not what people want to hear. But that is the driver of why people cared when he said, this is a thousand songs in your pocket. So when you, when you take the conversation to a place of here is the benefit, but here are the deeper psychological and emotional levels of why this matters. That's when things get really exciting. And that's kind of the, the thing too. I'm sorry, Jack, but they, it was, you know, when you get into some of those formulaic things and again, Don Miller, there's a bunch of people out there and um, especially on social media, they're like, I'm going to, I have, I, I've made a million followers and I'm, I'm going to tell you how to do it. And they're going to give these plans on how to do it, how to do, it, how to do it. The, I think the problem people get into, and because we've had clients who've read the same books <laughs> and they'll come mm -hmm. back and they'll say, you know what? Um, I need to make the client the hero. I agree. I think that's great. But mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you have to put you in front of everything or you, you know what I'm saying? It's like you, sometimes it can be about me. It can be I, because you, mm -hmm. you want to raise your flag and talk about what you do, but doing it in a context of how, what you do and how, who I am can reflect on you, the person that you're trying to, to sell to or talk to or communicate with, you know? Um, and it's just not as sometimes, you know, Hey, I, I read this formula, so I'm going to plug everything in. And it just doesn't always work that way. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's harder, you know? And I think that's the, the not question, but your, your thoughts on that. Like when you when somebody comes across these things or this new methodology or this new mm -hmm. system, because everybody's gonna have a way of doing it and understanding that and then understanding how to make it yours. Yeah, see, and, that, and that's, you're spot on with that, I believe, because there are, I mean, if you ask people, how many frameworks are there for telling a story? You, I mean, there, you know, there's, <clears throat> there's the story brand SB7. There's uh, Save the Cat. If you're talking about, uh, if you're talking about screenplays, there is The Hero's Journey. There is uh, a gentleman by the name of Park Howell who has his, uh, he he has a podcast called The Business of Story. He talks about the story cycle. It's loosely based around. I love Park. Have you met Park, Park before? He's I've the best. Not met, I have not met him, but I, we are connected online. I'm a huge fan, especially of the ABT, because mm -hmm. even his ABT framework that he and Randy Olson came up with, uh, well, and, and to be clear, Randy Olson is the one who uh, came up with that and Park has helped expand that. Um, it is another framework, but it all fits together like Russian nesting dolls that what big one inside the little one inside the little one. It's a, it all fits inside itself. Right. The, the more you look into itself, the most compressed theory of how to tell a story is still at the core of the most epic, expanded, multi-sequence, multi-installment multi tale you could ever imagine. It all boils down to the same thing, eventually. The challenge, to your point, Michael, is the idea of how, you know, what's, what's in your toolbox and what are the tools that you pull out at what points for which people? And that's the whole thing that uh, when I'm working with my clients, Sometimes they have they need tool X 
instead of tool Y. And you need someone who can say, here are all the tools. You need some, they, they need someone like you guys to say, hey, well, this is all the, this is all the context of all the clients that we've helped with, with their messaging and their branding. Here's what's worked for them. Here's what will probably not work for you. And here's the direction we're going to go. And here's why. So it's, it's knowing that those, what the tools are and when to pull them out. Yep, yep. Um, Park and I were introduced back in 2009, I think. A guy cool. named Michael Gass had um, kind of uh, sold his agency, got out of the agency business and become an advisor to ad agencies. And he gathered seven or eight of us from across the country uh, at his office in Birmingham and said, this social media thing, I mean, what are we doing? And so mm -hmm. um, each of us had become some sort of an expert in the space in our own way. And so we basically spent a weekend figuring out what it looked like, how it was going to work. Uh, you know, I was teaching classes to businesses and, and schools on how to protect students. And so everybody kind of brought it in and, and Park's approach to storytelling was mind blowing to me. And when um, later I read StoryBrand, I was like, I wonder if Park is angry that Donald gets all this credit when I think Park was really talking about it first, uh, but we still stay in touch and he's a great, great guy. I can introduce you um, if you ever want. Love that. I'm, yeah. I'm a huge fan, huge fan of Park. Yeah, me too. And I, and I will, and I will say one of the, uh, one of the tools that I found incredibly powerful is the concept that Park and Randy Olson talk about the concept of ABT. It's, uh, it talks about the idea of and, but, and therefore, and it's, uh, it is as fundamental in its nature as this idea of the character who wants something overcomes obstacles to get it and experiences transformation as a result, because you have this, uh, you know, the idea of building a statement or a message via and, but therefore mm -hmm. is something it's it's usually best suited in a persuasive scenario or an introductory scenario, not necessarily a, hey, let's make a human connection. Um, let's make a human connection and feel like we understand and trust each other. That's that that need to go in a different direction with a different tool for that. But man, when you help people come together in a place where they say, hey, this is the this is where things are. This is where we would like to see things. This is where things are, and this is what we want, but this is what's keeping us from getting there. Therefore, here's what we should do. It is so simple, but man, is it powerful. I do like that. I, I, I can, I like the, um, and again, different ways of approaching those things, but it's always like a, um, a question and a reveal or a statement and a purpose, you know, like, how does that flow? You know, and uh, I wrote down something when you were talking earlier too, I think one of the key things, you know, yeah, you don't have to necessarily be a writer or write even the story yourself. You have to have good people that can do those things and help you do those things. But none of that will happen if you don't know who you are, you know, yes. if you don't really know, if you're not authentic and who you are, you're not honest with what you are. I mean, we've had people come in and we do these, like I said, these assessments where it's six to eight weeks of research and development. And we do internal interviews and talk to the clients, talk to past employees, all this other stuff. And we come up with these answers and we bring it back to them. And sometimes it's like, oh, wow, I never saw it that way. And sometimes it's complete denial. And it's like, well, but I want I want names. Who said that? Well, they, they must be wrong. And all they're doing is defending themselves now instead of really listening and saying, yeah. maybe I'm not who we thought we were. And maybe I need to change some changes. Maybe I need to figure out, okay, maybe we're more this than that or whatever it may be. And that gets into more business side. And we're not, we're not into, into running businesses or telling them how to run their business, but we're, yeah. we're definitely want to hold the mirror up and say, look, this is what you say you are. And this is what the world's saying you are. And uh, one of the things we have is, is five R's of, of branding. And it's like our little philosophy and it's not ours, it's just things we borrowed from the world. And one of them is, you know, the consumer owns the brand. And I think that that works in everything. Like they're mm -hmm. the ones that are going to tell you who you really are. You can say I'm this, but if they don't agree, then there's a problem. There's a disconnect, right? And right. all that matters in the fact of, is your story authentic? And is it true? And is it honest? Because eventually they're going to figure you out. They're going to find out that what you're saying is not true. So you can tell great stories all day long, but unless you start at the beginning and really know who you are and really know what you're about and what you stand for and what your culture is like, you're going to fall short somewhere along the way. Yeah. You know what? If I, if I could piggyback off that, just the idea of figuring out who people are, figuring out who you are. There was a very important moment 
that happened in my life when I was a kid that I'd like to tell you about because it really, really tells, it, it, it was a completely forgettable moment when it happened, but somehow I managed, I managed to remember it and it pretty much has explained everything I've done with my life ever since and what I help everyone, including my clients do at this point. Because you're going back to the idea of, you know, most people see that I was, I spent 20 years in LA, COVID freed me from being physically tied to LA, which is amazing. And uh, when I actually learned the power behind all this stuff, it actually started way back at the beginning when I was four years old and I started learning how to play the piano. And I started playing by ear. I've started playing classically. And for the next 20 years of my life, I became known as Jeff, the piano guy. And uh, my dad has been a pastor almost all my life. And I got all my reps, almost all my reps with music on Sunday mornings in church. And so I got to the point where I could play a piece of Bach or Mozart. I could play the notes on the page. And everyone says, oh, Jeff, you're such an amazing piano player. You're, you know, this is so great. And uh, I thought that was amazing because it gave me an ego stroke and because I could play the notes on the page and I was amazing. Until one day there was an older musician at church who kind of pulled me aside and she said, Jeff, you know, it's all well and good to play the notes on the page. But when you get older, you need to learn to play from your soul. And at the time I was in elementary school, I was in maybe 10 or 11 years old. I thought emotions were stupid. And I thought what she was saying was the most ridiculous thing ever. So I ignored her. And uh, the thing that happened though, was I continued learning about music and I learned how to actually take those regular notes on the page, take that ordinary performance of a thing and to bring it to life. And when I learned how to do that on the piano, that's when people's reactions started changing. They started, instead of saying, Jeff, you're an amazing pianist, they would say, Jeff, that song that you played today was the exact song that I needed to hear. Thank you for playing that song. And they would say things like, every once in a while, they'd say, Jeff, the way that you played today brought me into an encounter with God. And I cannot thank you so much. Thank you for the gifts that you bring into the world. And that was when I realized bit by bit that these people that number one, this was way bigger than me. I need to get out of my own way and just get out of my own ego. Uh, there is a way of taking an ordinary message and elevating it to something extraordinary, which connects to the hearts and minds of people. It's true. It was true for me on piano as a kid. It was true for me learning how to do video production in high school. It was true for me on radio in college. It was true for me in 20 years of shaping the content for some of the largest content platforms on the face of the planet in Hollywood. And it's true for anyone who wants to take an ordinary message and elevate it to something extraordinary. It is absolutely possible for all of us. I love that. I don't have to say it for that. It was a good story. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, because but but really, the idea is the the emotion is so easy to it's so easy to take the emotion and the meaning out of business. That's what we all need, right? That's you know, you you want to talk you want to talk something super super commoditized. You want to just like how how do you sell soap? Well, if you're Dove, you don't say our soap gets you clean. No, Dove goes to their audience and says, "We see you, and we know that you feel that you are feeling less than in our society, and that you have to put all this stuff in your face in order to show up to be enough. And we're here to tell you that you are enough." We want you to realize and reveal the beauty that you already have right now by our soap. And everyone says, yes, here's my money. You know, it's that. That's where the humanity is. What I love, I love that you used we in there because that's kind of my argument. I fight with Jackie all the time on this because, you know, again, she's one of those people. And I have a certain client who um, watches too many videos sometimes and um, and reads too many books, which is great. They're very informed. But they, yeah. they push back and they say, you know, um, 
customer, the hero, the you, the you, the you, you use we in there because it's like, this is how we connect by saying who we are, that we get you and that there is a connection. And that is a huge thing. That is a huge idea behind all this, I think, is that we get you. We understand you. We we understand how hard it is in your life. And, and we're going to try to make it easier somehow with what we do. And that could be on any across any product, service, industry, whatever it may be. The fact that you are connecting with them on that level is a big deal, I think. And I think that's that's just, that's what's behind all of this. You know, because, again, I'm going to go write a story. I'm going to tell something interesting. I'm going to try to be creative. But that authenticity that you're talking about of, of knowing who you are, knowing who your audience is and having that connection, the answers are out there. You just have to connect all the dots. Yeah. And the power of that comes from that big picture strategic view of the strategic storytelling, which is how it's possible to write a powerful message to understand an audience and to deliver a message to them without ever even telling a tactical story. Mm -hmm. You can, the, the most amazing headlines in the world don't have to have, don't have to follow the hero's journey. It actually be really hard to do that because that had too many moving parts for a headline. But <laughs> anyway, it's uh, that that's a, that's one of the things that people are uh, sometimes get stuck with is, well, everything has to tell a tactical story. And the fact is, you don't. But the understanding of the bigger picture story and who's involved, what they want, what's helping them, what's getting in their way and how we can help them get that. That is the power of strategic storytelling. That's where people really latch on to things where they care. This is what they, this is what matters to them. And this is how we help them get what they want. Absolutely. I think, it, you know, and Jackie talks a lot about this and, um, you know, it's we, we, tribe building, you know, we want to, we want to belong. We want, we have, as a people, we need to belong to something and we want to have something that represents us. And when mm -hmm. I buy a product, sometimes it's not even about, I mean, it could be some kind of, you know, a consumer product or it could be an industry or whatever. I want to be associated with people that make me feel a certain way. I want to buy products that make me feel a certain way. And I want to tell people about it because it tells them about who I am too. You know, like I found something great. I want to share that with you. I want to share that story. I want to, I want to let you know that I have this the next best thing or that these people are so awesome. And then we get to the advocacy part of it all. And that's where really advertising is all about, right? There's nothing better than somebody giving you a recommendation, right? So how do mm -hmm. we get to that point? How do we influence it? We can't make it happen, but we can influence it. And we can we can build that, that audience up and that tribe and that following to where people really are passionate about it and they can't wait to go share that story. Yeah, it's good stuff for sure. You know, what I love about all this, and I, and I think the takeaway is just how important story is. And so often it feels like businesses are willing to kind of follow this set of best practices that they have in their head, which is code for we want to blend in. We want to look like our industry. We want to sound like our industry. We're scared to stand out. So what's, what's your thinking around differentiation and how to help companies find that thing that makes them different so that it can be communicated in a story? I think a lot of it can come down to knowledge of one's industry, knowledge of one's market, and saying, what are the values that we hold? And where does our industry or market not match up to those? And say, this is, this is what we believe you know, you can say the, 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 this is what the industry believes, but this is what we believe. And if you believe this, and if you want this future that we believe is possible, then come join us and let's make that journey come together. It doesn't make that future come together. And it, it's one of those things that that's where you start getting into the idea of thought leadership, because it's not just saying we're like everybody else come buy our product or service, you know, it's welcome to wallpaper land. You know, this, this is no, this is, we see a future that we believe is possible. And we want this future for you. We know who you are and we know that this is what's getting in your way. Here's how we, you know, here's how we want to make that happen for you. And when you start thinking in terms of that, you'll certainly, you, you'll, you'll start to find that the standard practice messaging doesn't hold up because it's, I, 
I mean, well, and, and even something as simple as, okay, so if you have corporate values or something like that, it's it's something, it's one thing to say, we believe in integrity. Well, congratulations. That's what everyone else says too. But if you're the one who says, there is a time. Oh, okay, so here, l- let me get specific. If you say, we take care of our people, we believe in taking care of people. Uh, that's very nice. That's a very nice idea. But when you tell a story, like a client of mine, who is a, uh, a fractional CFO, her name is Hannah. Hannah was working with one of her clients and she was saying, uh, and, and she knew that this CEO that she was advising wanted to protect the future valuation of her company. She also cares deeply, Hannah's client cares deeply about her people. She cares about her people. And so she was in, she was, she was feeling stuck because she felt like she needs to protect the future valuation of her company to protect for the possibility of exiting at some point. And at the same time, she deeply cares about her people. She wants to take care of them right now with an, with an appropriate compensation package. And so Hannah and I are talking about, okay, so how do we, how do we approach this? And we go through a session together and we, t- we use some, some of these tools and we come to a point where it's clear that, well, she doesn't have to choose between one or the other. It's it, you, you can have them both. And so that changed the way that Hannah changed her projection and her presentation to the CEO. The CEO, when she heard this, the reframing of how she could protect her company and protect her people, there, it, it was this weight that lifted off her shoulders. And both she and Hannah were in tears by the end of the call. That, if you can do something like that and attach that kind of a moment to we care about our people, that's the kind of stuff that's going to stick in people's hearts and minds. Fine. You want to talk about manufacturing? We manufacture widgets. Here's what the widget does for this client. There was one day when we, you know, when, when the, when, when our, when our client was super worried about, are we going to be able to get our widgets in time? And we said, no, we, we believe at our manufacturing company that we keep our promises. And we moved heaven and earth to make sure that all those widgets got delivered on time or, or, or whatever the situation might be when you can actually start addressing your messaging to say, let's attach tactical stories to concepts. That's how you can start standing out and be more human in the process. I love that so much. I just got chills Um, because that really sums it up. It's about how do we do the work? Because it's some hard work, but how do we do the work to make the impact? And I think um, too many people are willing to just kind of, uh, you know, dial it in or do the thing that's always been done instead of really lifting it up. All right, I'm going to lob a great big bomb into this love fest that we all have right now. It's going to make Michael very uncomfortable. But Uh um, where, where do you stand on AI? AI is a tool. AI is electricity. It's the cotton gin. It's the automobile compared to the horse. And all these elements brought in huge amounts of change. But the core things that people have always wanted have always been the same. And it goes back to the exact same things that we've been talking about this whole time. So um, I know, I know there's, a, I know coming from still having a, a lot of friends and contacts in the entertainment industry, you say AI, AI, there is a lot of fear attached to that. AI is attached to the emotion of fear. That's the, that, that's one of the other tools that I use with, with my clients is the concept of the thing under the thing. Everyone talks about what's on the surface. AI is the thing on the surface, but what really is the meaning attached to it that we actually have the, the feelings about, positive or negative, that's the thing under the thing. And so I do think just like any technical, technological sea change, there is 
up, you know, there, there, are, there is a lot of change that's going to happen. And that will, by definition, mean there are a lot of people who will lose their jobs. However, there have always been new avenues of expansion because of these, because of these, because, because of these kinds of sea change. Uh, I, I know it's a hot topic with you guys. What are, what are your thoughts on this? Well, you're about to get the perfect example of he said, she said. All that right. we wrote about in our book. Uh, you Michael, why don't you go first? <laughs> no, I mean, again, it, it does come up and it is something that is relevant. We talk about it a lot internally. Um, I, I use it for a lot of different things. Um, it is a great, you're right, great tool. Um, my, my concern with it from a really artistic or hum, humanistic standpoint is that we're, we're losing our soul a little bit to it. Um, it's kind of like a... a it, we're becoming a, a mediocre society um, creatively, you know, because now we can lean on that too much, you know, where's the, where's the spark, you know, and um, when we're leaning on it too much and cause it can do a lot. And, and, and the, I think the problem is I can almost kind of like when Photoshop came out um, and really right. started getting more and more advanced, you can, I can tell when somebody uses a Photoshop tool, like a effect or something, oh, they, they they went to the well on this one. You can almost pick it out versus somebody who knows how to use Photoshop and they really manipulated something and made it like you can't even tell, right? But you can tell when, when somebody's using a filter or something. And it's kind of the same thing with AI. You know, when you recopy, you can almost tell, like it's almost too perfect and it's too expected and it's too normal. And it's like, oh, wow, it sounds fine but it's not special, you know? And I think that's the, um, that's the human side of it. Now it, it's going to keep getting better. That's the scary part. It, and when it gets to the point where it can do it as well or, or not, do we as a, a world need to put more gauges on that to protect the, the, the artist and the humanity of it all, you know? It's a bigger right. conversation than probably we have right now, but I, mm -hmm. I think it's a great, I think it's a great tool. I'm, I'm afraid of people because I've had clients send me stuff and say, Hey, I ran this through chat GPT. And what do you think? I'm like, well, it sounds fine. Um, but here's all the things that's missing, or here's all the things that you're not including because you didn't feed it the right information. And so right. if you don't have the, 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 I, the processes of how to prompt it and feed it the right way and go through the, those steps and being able to come back and cross check and add in your own special thing, then you end up with, again, mediocre, mediocre stuff. Right. Jackie. I agree. <laughs> and um, I do use the tool uh, toolkit example all the time. I, um, I've started to kind of uh, change my thought on it just a little bit. So I love the tools. I, I use it as a brainstorming partner. I think that it, um, it helps because, like I said, I, I'm not naturally – I don't – that's not my natural talent. So I need something to kind of help me get the ideas out of my head into something that makes sense and then kind of go from there. Um, but lately, and I mean, just in the past uh, couple of weeks, I've started to think about the, the challenge that I see is it makes everybody think they're a writer. And it reminds me of all the times that I see people crowdsource logos because they don't appreciate the value of a strategic brand identity and they don't appreciate the work and research and toil and trouble that really goes into doing it the right way. And sometimes people just don't have good a good eye. And so they're willing to accept something inferior from a design landscape. And I'm not a designer, just married to one and employ a bunch of them and have, you know, worked in that space for almost three decades. Uh, and so I can tell when a logo is created by an amateur. I don't always know why. I'm not always sure exactly what's wrong with it, but I know it's wrong. Just like Michael can identify Photoshop's um, photos. And so I'm fearful that we are going to lower the bar on good writing because there's going to be so much writing. And then I'm reminded of, okay, well then hold on. When there's a sea of bland, the really good stuff tends to rise to the top and gets found. So yes. maybe it's not so bad because maybe human well-written strategic things, just like really well-designed things, will always come to the surface. You know, it's it's really kind of interesting because in the early years of my career in Hollywood, I was sitting at a console as a television editor. I was, quote unquote, editing video, but really I was taking, you know, all the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of resources and time and money were funneling into this collective 
uh, this collection of elements that I had access to, and I was the one who was shaping it to create the finished product for the goal of creating a specific effect in the audience. And so at that point, I thought, this is what video editing is. It, this is, it is art. I am giving of my own creativity. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm seeking to elevate this to the extraordinary, as I've been doing my whole life, as I've been talking about, you know, just in this conversation. What I did not realize was that there is a spectrum of video editing, uh, and a lot of it is not particularly exalted or in any way artistic. A lot of people outside the entertainment industry, they think video editing is you go, you, you, you snip off the beginning and the end of something and you've edited the video and you just hit upload and it goes to the internet. And they say, see, I just edited that video. I just need someone to do, do, do the video editing and uh, just uh, I'll pay a couple bucks. I'll, I'll pay a couple bucks to someone who gets paid in rupees or bots or something like that. And we'll all go home happy. So there, there is that spectrum. And I think when we think of, when we talk about AI coming in and um, encouraging everyone to think I'm a writer, it's very similar to back in the day when, when programs like PageMaker came in and said, oh, and everyone says, oh, now I am a graphic designer and layout artist. You know, and now ever since the world has been filled with really bad layout and design, but I think you're spot on. I think the, uh, in, in the world of bland, the human rises to the surface. Absolutely. Um, I have a way off the topic question. Um, I skimmed, you know, having worked in Los Angeles for years and having still a kind of tangential connection to the industry, I was aware in the periphery of all of the um, talk around the unions last year and the strikes mm -hmm. and at some point picked up what I think was the crux of um, why there was a protest. And one of the line items that kind of jumped out at me was this um, demand that there be a certain minimum number of writers on every project. And it reminded me of an interview that I had read uh, from the creator of Yellowstone, who explained that, you know, he he kind of concepted it. He wrote the original, maybe whole first season. I don't remember the exact details. And then he was trying to story, um, he was trying to show run three different series or four different series and couldn't keep writing everything. And it reminded yeah. me of the early years of the West Wing. And so a team of writers was hired and he never felt like that work was up to par of what he wanted his work to be. So then he wrote all the episodes while they watched. Okay. So that's in the back of my mind when I'm reading about the strikes and this minimum number of writers. And I thought, you know, I, I don't come from a union family. I don't work in a union shop. So I may not have a full appreciation for the value of unions. I, I willingly accept that. But is a minimum number of writers really the best way to approach a creative endeavor? It feels like that good talent rises to the top. And so what's your thought on that? Did I misunderstand it or do you have a different perspective on it? Well, I want to be circumspect because uh, number one, I do not claim to be a writer or an actor. Um, I am familiar with uh, with union culture, with Hollywood union culture. Uh, I've been a member of the Editors Guild as part of the IA Yahtzee for many years. So from that from that context, I can say I can say that unions were established for a very important reason. Usually, nine out of 10 times, the unions are established because there are wrongdoings being done against the people on the ground doing the doing. And the management says, we're going to squeeze you at the expense of, at the expense of you, the doers. And so the unions come in and say, all right, we're going to uh, we're going to stand up collectively and say, no, this is not okay. We deserve better. And so, what happens with that is, we we deserve to not be mistreated, and very easily cross the line in union culture to we deserve this and this and this and this, and uh, 
very quickly, it is possible to come to a place where entities that are designed to protect people end up empowering an attitude of entitlement and deserving. So when you come up against a, uh, the, when, when, when you come up, when you put that against the entrepreneurial mindset of, I am responsible for the results as a leader, as a producer, as a director, as the CEO, you know, that kind of a thing, that's, that, that is a fundamental difference in philosophy. So to your question about is having a minimum number of writers the solution um, or, or, or was that the key issue of the writer's strike? Um, it was one of them. I will also say uh, there was a lot of elements that, that there, there were other elements that were hot button issues like AI, where studios were saying, we're going to take all the scripts of our show that have already been written and we're going to train our own our own language models to uh, write our own episodes and you are no longer needed. And the writers say, ah, that's not fair. You're taking away the humanity, which, which is 100% true. So right. it's, um, it's a tricky balance. And, yes. when, and when it comes to minimum number of writers, there are scenarios where it makes sense to keep management from saying, we are going to scrimp and cut your budgets and cut your budgets and expect you to continuously do more than with, do more with less. And there are times when that's necessary. There are other times when it becomes a problem and becomes unhelpful. Right. Right. No, fair answer. I think very fair. And, you know, I, obviously we both have had connections to that industry. We know people still in the industry. And so it's always interesting to see and hear the, um, observations from the outside because it's often very different from how it feels on the inside. So, yeah. you know, it, it, it always reminds me like, is this now going to go on the list with the $250 hammer that the army bought or the $125 an hour person to stand and watch the auto line go by, you know, it, it's mm -hmm. like, Oh, because I do agree with the, the foundation of unions and the importance of them and the role of, you know, protecting child labor, ensuring that the, the individual has a voice, um, you know, making sure that there's um, fair that they don't uh, treatment get limbs of overtime. Chopped off. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Safety yeah. is important. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, I am shocked to look up and realize this has been an hour. I don't know how that's possible. Uh, <laughs> Jeff, this has been a delightful conversation. Please tell the people how to best reach you so that they can carry on this chat if they would like to. Absolutely. The, there is one place that I would love for listeners of this podcast to go, and that, that is storygreenlight.com slash razor, as in razor branding. Storygreenlight.com slash razor. And when you go there, you'll find some resources for how you can put these ideas into play for yourself. And uh, when you come to a point when you'd like some help saying, hey, what are the tools that I need to use and how, how do I or how, do I, how does my team put these tools into use? Uh, that's what we help people do. So you can figure out how to you can get that connection on that page, too. So storygreenlight.com slash razor. Perfect. I love that. And I love that you created stuff special for our guests. I mean, for our listeners. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for your time and your talent and your resources and being willing to share your knowledge. Um, hopefully we can get you and me and Michael and Park into a room one day and all hang out together. That would be awesome. That would be fantastic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Take care. Bye.